Hello everyone, this is Charlie from the Bloomingdale Public Library and today we're going to be discussing some free office software called LibreOffice. In specific, we're going to look at their word processing program called Writer. So what is LibreOffice? LibreOffice is an open source, free to use office suite available for Windows, Linux, and Mac OS, though you can donate to the project if you like. If you've ever used Linux, you'll see that LibreOffice tends to be packaged with their distributions. The LibreOffice suite is made up of six applications, most with Microsoft Office equivalents. There is Writer, which is for word processing, so that would be something like Word. Calc, which is for spreadsheets, and that would be like Excel. Impress is for slideshow presentations, so that would be like PowerPoint. We're going to be looking at that next week. Draw, which is more of a graphic application, kind of similar to Publisher, so for making uh, posters and pamphlets and things like that. Math is a formula editor that you can use with the other applications. And base would be like access, and that's for working with databases. So many of you might have heard of something called OpenOffice, and consider that's the go-to free office software. Um, OpenOffice is another open source free to use office suite with pretty much the same look and functionality as LibreOffice, and there's a reason for that. A little bit of history, OpenOffice I believe was once called StarOffice, and then that was picked up by Sun Microsystems, who then named it OpenOffice and made it open source. And after that, Oracle bought Sun Microsystems and they discontinued the project. And they gave up the rights to a company called Apache, who does continue to develop for it. However, when OpenOffice was discontinued at Oracle, most of the volunteers of the project went on to create LibreOffice and they were able to use the original code creating a fork in the program. So LibreOffice and OpenOffice are both still in development, but you'll see that LibreOffice updates far more frequently. And on top of that, LibreOffice can borrow new features and functionality from OpenOffice, while OpenOffice can't do the same for LibreOffice. And that has something to do with the licensing. So now that we know what LibreOffice is, let's go ahead and install it on our computer. To do that, we would open the browser of our choice. I'm going to be using Google Chrome. In the search bar, let's go ahead and type in LibreOffice.org. And that will take us to their website. On their homepage, you'll see this big green Download Now button. We're going to go ahead and click on that. And that will take us to their download page. On their download page, you'll notice that there's two versions. The numbers might be different by the time you see this video, but what these two versions are will represent the same thing. The top one will be the later version, so it will have the latest features, but might still be going through some beta testing. You might see some functionality missing. You might run into bugs. So unless you know there's something in the new version that you wanted to use, I would recommend using the version at the bottom, which is the older version, which is more tested, more stable, and the functionality should be fully fleshed out. So once you decide which one you want to use, make sure you have the right operating system in the drop down, and click the download button. When you do that, it'll take you to the secondary page where you can download their built-in help as well. You can feel free to do that if you like, otherwise you can always go on the internet and find the help that you need. And below that is the optional donation, which it's up to you if that's something you want to do, but otherwise LibreOffice is free to use. So you'll see where, you know, depending on the browser, you'll see the progress of the download. I'm going to go ahead and X out of that. Regardless of the browser you're using, if you go to the downloads folder, you should see the Windows installer file there, and it'll be LibreOffice with a version number and your operating system. I'm going to go ahead and double click that. Click Run. It'll calculate the space. Click Next. 
On this screen, I would recommend using a typical install unless you know what you're doing. But just to have a look at the custom install, you'll have the option to install some additional extensions uh, as well as some additional languages, which will help for things like spell check. You'll also have the opportunity to change which folder you install the program to. I'm going to back out of that and choose the typical install. Click Next. Um, I would probably leave it with just the shortcut on the desktop. If you want to load LibreOffice on startup every time, I suppose you could. And once you do that, click Install. You'll see the bar go for a little bit. You may get a window regarding your permissions. Just say yes. And then you'll probably get this screen. The screen will offer to close your programs and finish the install or do a restart at the end. I'd recommend doing a restart at the end. You never know how the programs that you have running will affect the install. In my case, I have recording software running, so if I were to close applications, it would cut off the recording. So I'm not going to finish this through just so we don't have that issue. But from here, you'd click OK. You would see the progress bar goes, and then depending on your options, you'll either see programs flash closed and open, or you'll get the option to restart. And once you're done, you will have a LibreOffice icon on your desktop ready to open. Now that we have LibreOffice installed on our computer, there's a couple ways we can go about actually opening it. During the install, we set it to create a shortcut on the desktop, and that is right here. So it says LibreOffice 7.0 with a page uh, kind of fold in the upper right hand corner. If we double click that, it'll take us to this kind of home page here where anything we opened previously will show up in the middle. Or we can go about finding files with the open file, remote file options. Or we can create a new document by clicking on any of the programs in the suite. If I were to X this guy out, again, this is just a file I opened recently, we get this page. And you'll see it says drop a document here or pick up an app on the left side to create one. So if I were to click and drag a document over here, you'll see it opens it right up. I'm going to go ahead and close that. If you're working in Windows, another way to go about opening LibreOffice, if you lost your shortcut or didn't create one, if you go to the Start menu, go under L for LibreOffice, and you'll see there's a folder here. Click on it, and you'll see all the programs in the suite. Click on LibreOffice Writer, and that'll take you straight to a writer document from scratch. I'm going to close that. One other way we can go about opening LibreOffice is by clicking on a file directly. So right here, I have a sample writer document. If I double click on that, it opens it right up. Or if you have multiple word processing programs on your computer, it might not open by default. So if that's the case, you can right click on the document and go to open with. And you'll see we have LibreOffice and Word 2016. So if you select LibreOffice, we'll wind up back where we were with our document ready to go. And just to show you though, we've got this Word document here too. If I right click and go to Open With, we have the LibreOffice Writer and Word 2016 options available to us. So let's go ahead and try to open it with LibreOffice Writer. and that worked just fine. So you can open LibreOffice Writer documents in Word, and you can also open Word documents in LibreOffice. That's also a big difference between LibreOffice and OpenOffice, is you can actually save to Microsoft file types by default by going to File, Save As, and you'll see the Microsoft options there. So if you wanted to save as a, a doc or a docx, file extension, you can do that in LibreOffice. And so that'll be more compatible 
with perhaps people that you're working with if you're turning in projects to class and you only have LibreOffice but need to give it in as a Word document. It's a nice feature to have. And those are a couple amongst many more ways of simply opening up LibreOffice Writer. So now that we have LibreOffice Writer open, let's have a look at the interface. If you've used a word processing program in the last 20 years, this probably looks pretty familiar. At the top we have our menus. By default we do not have tabs like we do in the Microsoft Office Suite. We've got File and Edit, which we see in most document creation programs, View, Insert, etc. And as you get a quick look, you'll see this is where we would access most of the functions we'd like to use. Below that is the standard toolbar that will be present pretty much all the time, no matter what we're looking at. So that's opening a new document, finding a document, saving a document, printing, spell check, etc. And below that is a contextual toolbar, which will change depending on what we're working with. So right now we're working with text, so we see you know, font style, font size, uh, font effects, etc. However, if we were to insert an image, you'll notice that the contextual toolbar changes to functions that are more relevant to working with an image. So in the standard toolbar, I'm going to click Undo. That takes us back to where we were. Continuing on, below that, we have the ruler, which we use for setting tabs. We've got a status bar at the bottom, which shows us our page, words, character count. On the right side, we have the page view and the zoom. And then on the far right, we have the sidebar, which gives us access to most of the things we have available through the toolbars and the menu, but it's a more convenient way to look at things. So if I click on Properties here, you see it shows us most of what we have in the toolbar already, but we can see a bit more with regards to spacing options, paragraph options, and things like that. So it's more of a convenience factor than anything else. Click the X to close that up. One more thing I want to look at is, you'll notice at the top, in the top right here, we have double arrows. If I click on that, you'll see a few more icons here. And same with the double arrows below that. This is a continuation of the toolbars, and we're seeing that because I don't have LibreOffice maximized. If you have a small screen that you're working with, you might still see that as well. But if I maximize LibreOffice as we're at right now, you can see that the double arrows go away, and we can see the rest of the icons for the toolbars. I mentioned before that we can switch to a tabbed look if you prefer. If you go to View, User Interface, Tabbed, that'll give us a, something that more resembles a ribbon in the Microsoft Office Suite. So if you go to File, Home, Insert, etc., you'll notice that we're now using a tabbed interface. So if that's something you prefer, by all means, help yourself. If you want to get out of it, though, click on these three lines user interface, standard toolbar, that brings us back. If there's something that you're looking for or something that you just would prefer to see versus searching through menus, you can go to View, Toolbars, and you'll notice there's a whole bunch more toolbars to look at, and depending on which one you select, it'll appear, appear in various places on the interface. So I chose 3D tools, and they all showed up down here in the lower left, but it's grayed out because we're working with text right now. Just to pull up another one, Toolbars, Find. You'll see this is not grayed out because we can actually work with these options with the text. So that's a brief overview of what we're looking at when we open up LibreOffice Writer. From here on out, we're going to be discussing the functionality of LibreOffice Writer. We're probably not going to get very far, but we should get a pretty good start, and I'll point you at resources for further learning. I'm going to start at the very beginning as far as word processing goes, but I'm going to go kind of quick. So it'll be a good refresher for people that haven't done a lot of word processing, 
while emphasizing the similarities between LibreOffice Writer and other word processing programs. However, if you were looking for an introduction to word processing, uh, I might be going a little fast. So you can either slow the video down with the YouTube settings by clicking on the gear in the lower right, or you can stop and start to keep pace with what I'm discussing. Otherwise, if you are looking for something a little slower to learn the basics of word processing, I would recommend searching YouTube for something along those lines, something like introduction to word processing or word processing for beginners. <clears throat> So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. We've got a blank page here. I'm gonna enter some text. Text will always be entered at the flashing cursor. So I'll go ahead and type. You'll find that sentences are automatically capitalized by default. That's just LibreOffice. Um, using its autocorrect as you go. Otherwise, if you wanted to capitalize a word in the middle of a sentence, hold down the shift key while hitting the character. Also, if you wanted to make something like an exclamation point or a dollar sign or any of the characters that appear above a second character on a keyboard key, you would use the shift key. So if I hold down shift and press the one key, that is how I'll make an exclamation point. Or if I wanted to make a percent sign, I would hold down shift and the five key. Or if I wanted to make a question mark, I would hold down shift and the forward slash. So that is how you capitalize and use special characters. If you wanted to capitalize multiple characters in a row, press the caps lock, enter your word, and then press the caps lock again to turn it off. If you wanted to remove characters, you could use the backspace key. So the backspace key will start at the flashing cursor and it'll go back one character at a time, removing it as you go. So if I hit the backspace key a couple times, that is how you can remove a couple characters by going backwards. Otherwise, if you take the mouse cursor and place it somewhere else, or it can use the arrow keys. With the mouse, just remember that you have to left click first. And now you can use the delete key, which will delete characters in front of the cursor while not moving. So use the backspace key to go backwards. Use the delete key to delete forwards. In order to go to another line, what you do is you just keep typing. So you'll see that as you type, the cursor will automatically jump to the next line to continue. You can also use the enter key to go to the next line. But when you do that, you're creating a new paragraph. And that's important to know because a lot of the formatting tools are specific to paragraphs or characters or pages. So when you hit the enter key, you're creating a new paragraph and that will affect certain formatting tools. To indent a paragraph, use the tab key that will automatically indent either a half inch or six characters, something along those lines. You can also use the tab key in the middle of a line and you can tap it multiple times. I recommend using the tab key instead of the enter key because it will make editing and formatting a whole lot easier as spaces tend to get all over the place and make things kind of messy. Now we're going to discuss text selection, which makes editing a lot more efficient. And what you would do is use your mouse, position the cursor where you'd like to select the text, use the left mouse button, Click it and hold it down, and then drag the mouse to where you would like your text selected. And once you're done, release the left mouse button, and there you go. The text will stay selected. If you wanted to deselect some text, all you got to do is click outside of the box, and everything will be deselected. Alternatively, you can use the arrows and the shift key. 
click the cursor where you'd like to start selecting text, hold down the shift key, use the arrows, and once you've got your text selected, release the shift key, and there you go, the text is selected. So with the text selected, we can do a couple of things. One thing you can do if you wanted to just replace the text that's selected is start typing. So what happens is the text is basically deleted and you start typing at the beginning of where the text was selected because that's where the cursor winds up. Alternatively, you can use the cut, copy, and paste functions. So I'm going to again select some text, click, hold, drag, release, and the cut, copy, and paste functions are right in the top in the standard toolbar. As we roll over them, you can see that there's also shortcuts listed. So that's Control X, Control C, and Control V. And those will just be a way of doing things a little more quickly with the keyboard. Um, those shortcuts are worth remembering because you use them in a lot of other programs, as well as Control Z to undo, Control Y to redo, Control S to save, and Control P to print. So with our text selected, I'm going to go ahead and click Cut. And as you see, the text that was selected is cut from place. When you cut text, it goes to a place called the clipboard where we can then paste from. So with the text cut, I'm going to go ahead and click Paste. And the text comes back. However, unless you replace the text in the clipboard, the text that you selected and, and cut or copied will stay there until it's replaced with something else. So if I hit paste again, you can see I can keep pasting the same thing over and over again. So I'm going to go ahead and use the undo key or the undo command to undo all that extra pasting. And now I'm going to select the last sentence here. Again, I'm going to click, drag, release, and I'm going to click copy this time instead of cut. It does the same thing as cut, except it leaves the text in place. So if I were to click paste, you can see once again, we can paste to our heart's content because whatever goes in the clipboard stays there until it's replaced. I'm going to click undo a couple times to get all that back to where we were at. Again, the undo function is probably the most important function in any program because it lets you goof around, make mistakes, and go back to the way things were. So again, control Z or the undo function is always something worth making a note of. So that's the basics of editing with the text selection tool. Um, being able to select text is also important for formatting, which is what we're going to discuss next. Now that we've discussed adding and editing text, we can start talking about formatting text, which just means changing the way that the text looks. To do that, we're going to be using the second toolbar we see when we first open LibreOffice, as that is the toolbar that pertains mostly to uh, font and paragraph formatting. So the first tool that we see is a drop-down menu. It says Default Paragraph Style. And if I click on the down arrow, we see a bunch of different kinds of paragraphs. And each of these paragraphs has preset attributes to change the way it looks. So if I click on title, you'll see it changes a whole bunch of things, such as the font style, the font size, and even the alignment. So each of these types of paragraphs has presets to change their look. And it's just a quick and easy way to uh, add a look to your document. Microsoft Word actually has a very robust collection of preset styles and themes. And while LibreOffice Writer doesn't have as much uh, already established, you can go in and set your own customizations. But we're not going to be discussing that today. So I'm going to go ahead and undo what we did. And moving to the right, we see the text style. So you can either set the text style before or after you start typing. So with this text selected, I'm going to go ahead and choose Century Gothic and you see it changes the text styling. If I undo that, click outside the selected text, 
We've now set it to Century Gothic. You'll notice that we left the original text styling alone and then changed to Century Gothic <clears throat> after the fact. So you can do that with pretty much any of these attributes that we're going to discuss for font. You can either select the text and then change it or change it and then start typing. So before or afterwards. You'll notice here with the text selected that we don't see anything in the font styling box. That's because there's two font styles selected at the same time and it doesn't know what to put in there so it doesn't put anything at all. The same thing will happen with the font size if you select text with multiple sizes. So looking at the rest of what we have to work with here, we've got a B for bold, an I for italicize, U for underline, and you'll notice as I roll over these, some of these will have shortcuts tied to them and some will not. Strike through, and you can do multiple at once if you want. I'm going to unselect these. The next one is superscript, which it's easier to see if we only select one word at a time. As you see, it shrinks the word and raises it up. And subscript will shrink the word and lower it. These work like toggles, so if you were to start typing, we have the word bold, it's perfectly fine. Hit the B, that is bolded. Toggle it off. We're back to plain text. So that is how these works. These are all toggles that you can toggle on and off, either as you type or with text selected. So the last two are font color. So I'll go ahead and select some text, click on the down arrow, and choose red. And that sets the text to red. The next one over is the highlight color, which is kind of more like the background color. Select yellow, click out, and you can see I've set the text to red and the highlight color to yellow. If you continue typing, it will retain those attributes. If you wanted to turn those attributes off, it's kind of quirky, but what I would do is continue typing, select the text, and then set everything back. So we had black and no fill, and there we go. So that are the basic options for formatting text. I think you'll find they're very similar to any of the other programs you might have used in the past. Now we're going to discuss formatting paragraphs. You remember that I said earlier that you only want to hit enter to start a new paragraph, not to just jump to the next line. And these tools will not work correctly if you use enter for any other reason than starting a new paragraph. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and put the cursor in the second paragraph. So now any paragraph form formatting that I do will only affect the second paragraph. I purposely didn't tab my paragraphs just to emphasize what a paragraph actually is, and that's simply text divided by hitting the enter key. So with the cursor in the second paragraph, everything is uh, automatically aligned to the left, but if I click align center, again, only the second paragraph will align to the center. If I click align right, only the second paragraph is aligned along the right margin. And if I click justified, it tries to align the paragraph on the left and the right side, and that's mostly for making uh, very well-defined columns, which, you know, I honestly you don't see too much outside of newspapers and magazines. So I'm going to jump over the bulleted and number list for now, and we'll look at indent, increasing indent. Again, only indents the paragraph that you're working on. Decrease indent, same thing. Oh, I still have justified on. I'm going to go back to align left. Set line spacing. You would think this would affect all the lines or maybe just the line that you're currently on, but it is a paragraph attribute, so it will affect the line spacing in the selected paragraph and only sele the selected paragraph. So if I adjust the spacing to two, 
You see the lines in the second paragraph are spaced out in double spacing, but the top and the bottom paragraphs are left alone. I'll set that back to one. Increase, increased paragraph spacing affects the spacing in between the paragraphs, but only for the paragraph selected. So again, the spacing between the second and the first and the second and the third paragraphs are affected. And if there are any other paragraphs in the document, they would retain the same spacing. So it would only, again, affect the second paragraph. Decrease paragraph spacing does the same thing, only backwards. Next, we're gonna look at bulleted and numbered lists. Maybe it doesn't make much sense to put lists in with the paragraph formatting, but if you think about it, each item on the list is essentially its own paragraph. So it is, in a way, uh, a form of paragraph formatting. So to start a bulleted list, we'll go ahead and start on a new line here. And we go to the toggle bulleted list function click on it, and immediately we see there's a bullet there. So if you really were passionate about your bulleted lists, you can click the down arrow, choose another, another uh, image for your bullet if you like. Or if we click on more bullets, click on image, you see we have some colorful options here. And you can even import your own images to act as bullets if you really wanted, but I'm not going to be discussing it in this video. So. To go ahead and start our bulleted list, we we'll go ahead and type in cars, hit enter. Once I hit enter, you see it continues the bulleted list. Hit enter. Instead of another, instead of another item, let's go ahead and hit tab. You'll see once I do, it goes an item level deeper in the list. So we'll go ahead and put wheels, doors. When I hit enter, you'll notice that it continues on the same level that we left off on. We can either hit tab to go yet another level deeper, or we can hold down shift and hit tab, and that's how we would go back up a level. So if you like, in the middle of your list, you can go ahead and click on that down arrow by the bullets, and you can choose another image and you see it affects all the other bullets at that level. I'm gonna click undo to do that. Type wings, hit enter. Once you're done with your bulleted list, you can go ahead and click on the toggle bulleted list function and it brings us back out. So with that done, let's go ahead and have a look at numbered lists which are essentially the same thing, except that each level is incremented as you go. So I will go ahead, click on the toggle number list, and you see we get a big old number one. So type something in, hit enter, and instead of continuing on, it goes up to number two. Hit enter, goes up to number three, and again, it's a numbered list that just keeps incrementing with each uh, item at that level. If I hit tab, you see it starts over. So this item level gets its own numbering system. Hit tab to go in yet another level. Hit shift tab to go back up. And just like with the bulleted list, we can go ahead and click on the down arrow there and we can customize things on the fly and anything that you would choose it will customize the rest of the items at that level at the same time so if I were to continue on you see it goes to D instead of starting over at 4 click on the down arrow I'll click on more numbering and that brings us to the same box that we saw before with the bullets if you really wanted you can go ahead and choose bullets and now you're mixing numbered and bulleted lists together so there's instances where you might want to do that but unless you know what you're doing I wouldn't recommend messing up with your settings too much just be aware that that's something you can do and if it's something you do by accident you can go hit the undo button and you're back to where you were at 
So we've discussed font formatting and paragraph formatting. So let's go ahead and finish up with page formatting. To do a little bit of page formatting, go to the Format menu and go down to Page Style. And that will bring up this window here. So we have a few options at our disposal here. The first one is the letter size. If you happen to be using a standardized envelope uh, size or maybe letter or legal paper, you can go ahead and select that from this menu here. Otherwise, you can go ahead and use these dimensions to set a custom size. You can also adjust the orientation from portrait to landscape. Just go ahead and do that. You can also customize the margin sizes. So if you were to set them to something that's too small, you'll get this little window here that tells you that you're printing off the page. So I would usually recommend not going any smaller than they set it, which is a quarter of an inch. A few other options here, um, namely page numbers is one you might want to mess with. However, I think I'm good with just one, two, three versus all these Russian and Bulgarian options here. I'm going to click OK. And now you see we have a uh, landscape format with narrow margins. One last thing I want to show with page formatting is adding headers and footers. So if you click in the top margin or the bottom margin, you get a little demarcation here. It says header, default page title, and then a little plus sign. We can click on that. And now we can type something that'll appear on every page. So if I just run off some A's here, now you see we've got A's on every single page in the header. I'm going to click below the bottom margin here, click the plus next to footer, and I'm going to click on the down arrow, insert page number. As you see in the far left corner, we have a three. The next page we have a two and a one. It knows what page it is automatically and sets it correctly. If you wanted to stick it on the other side, on the lower right hand side, like I would prefer, all you got to do is click the align right and it throws it over to the lower right corner instead. So that's a couple quick little things you can do with page formatting. From there, I want to go ahead and discuss some review options, namely find and replace, as well as the spell check. So find and replace is this little magnifying glass with an A and a D there. I'm going to go ahead and click on that, and this is where you can put in a word to find. I've already got the word bunch in there. I don't really have too many words, but if you do want to find the word bunch in the document, you just click next, and it'll start at the cursor and work its way down and find the instances of the word that you're looking for. So it found bunch here. If I do find next, jumps to bunch again. If we wanted to replace the word bunch with, let's say, ton, just type ton in there and we can click replace and you can see it replace the word bunch with ton. I can go ahead and do it again or if instead of going one by one you just want to find them all and replace them all you can do find all right here you see it highlights all the bunches and you can click replace all to replace all the bunches with tons and now everything seems to line up pretty pretty nicely vertically but that's just a coincidence. So you also have the options to match the case or whole words only versus partial words, um, which could be helpful if you're searching for a small word that can appear in much larger words, like the word he appears in the word then, that would trigger a lot of replacements that you wouldn't want. So closing that, I'm gonna misspell some words real quickly here. and we click on spell check. The shortcut is F7. That's another common shortcut that you might want to commit to memory. Here we can see it goes from the top down and tells you the words that don't appear in the dictionary. If you wanted to do a dictionary check against another language, just click on the down arrow for this drop down menu here. And here you can choose to ignore or add to the dictionary, which will mean that word will no longer count as misspelled. So if it's a word you made up that appears in a story that you're writing, and you don't want it to trigger the ch spell check, you can just add it to your dictionary. So if the word resembles something that is in the dictionary, it'll give you the option to change it. Otherwise, you can go ahead and go back and change it yourself.
The last topic I want to cover is kind of a fun one, and that's inserting an image. To insert an image, you can either use the Insert menu at the top by clicking Insert and then selecting Image from the menu, or you can click on the Insert Image icon in the middle of the standard toolbar. Once you do that, a window will pop up, and then you have to find your image. When you find it, select the file, click Open, and when you do, it will put the image right in the middle of your document, depending on where your cursor was located. So you'll see an anchor, which will pin the image to either a page or a character or a paragraph. I'm not going to really get to go into detail with that. You'll also notice squares around the perimeter of the image. The squares on the corner, if you click and drag on them, will change the size of the image. If you click and drag on one of the squares on the sides, top or bottom, it will distort the image in one of the dimensions. There are reasons why you might want to do that, but I'm going to undo the distortion to keep everything in the correct ratio. If you wanted to further change the size of the image, you can also find the crop image function towards the right side of the toolbar. If you click on crop image, those squares become uh, light blue brackets. So click and drag on one of the light blue bracket icons and you can crop out or add to the image. I don't know why you'd want to add blank space to the image, but we will crop this just a little bit. Once you're done cropping, there's a few other things we can do. To the right of the crop, you have flip vertical, flip horizontal, rotating left and right 90 degrees. And the far right rotation will actually place little red circles on the corners and you can rotate about those corners. And we'll leave it right side up. If, as you saw, when I clicked away from the image, the image toolbar went away. When you click on the image again, the toolbar comes back. A few more of these options that we have. Um, a big one is the wrap, and that is how the words will interact with the image. So if you click on the first option, everything will go on the top and the bottom. And as you move the image around by clicking and dragging, you'll see the text will move to accommodate the image. Page wrap will wrap everything around the top, bottom, and middle. That's my personal favorite. Optimal page wrap will take the margins into account. Wrap left will put all the text on the left side. Wrap right will put all the text on the right side. And then wrap through will put the image just right over the text. So you're actually blocking content. If you really wanted to do that, you can kind of accommodate with the transparency, which on the far right has a certain percentage and it starts at zero. But if you put it at like 20%, you see now you can kind of read the text with the image still in the background. I'm going to put the transparency back to 0%. I'm going to set the wrap back to page wrap so everything is on the top, bottom, and sides. And we'll have a look at a few more things here. We have a couple border options where we can add borders. I'm going to put borders on all four sides. It's kind of thin and hard to see there. Border style, so you can add a little style to your border. This is a double lines all the way around. You can add a color to your borders. Let's make it uh, red. So now we have a red border with double lines. We can add a background color as well. Let's make it something that we'll be able to see. How about green? So now our border has a green background. It's kind of ugly, but you get the point. This drop down here where it says default will let you change to grayscale if you like. Black and white, which is terrible. Set it back to default. And this little wand here is a whole bunch of filters that you can play with. Uh, we won't get into too much detail here, but you can see we have an aging filter and that seemed to also flip it upside down. We'll go ahead and undo that. Flip it back. And that's inserting an image. 
So that's about all I have time for today. Just a few closing notes. If you wanted to print your document, you can either click the printer and the standard toolbar or hit Control P. When you do that, it'll bring up this screen here. You can have a look at the options under the General tab, under the LibreOffice Writer tab, uh, mess with your printer directly through the properties, and then click Print when you're all set. I'm going to cancel out of that. If you wanted to save your document, you can just click on the disk here or hit Control S. But if you click the down arrow, you have a few more options, such as Save As. And when you do Save As, you'll see that you're saving as an ODF text document, which has an extension of ODT. That is a standardized format that will open to most programs, but for uh, various reasons, you might want to save as a Word document. Uh, 2007-365, which will have an extension of DOCX. Another version you might want to save as is a rich text document, which will usually do away with all the formatting, but will open in pretty much anything. I'm going to cancel out of that. And one final thing you might want to do is export as a PDF. There's an icon on the standard toolbar to do that, just next to the save and print icons. If you click on that, it will bring up the screen here. I'm not sure why it doesn't give you the option in the save as window, but if you do export, that will give you the option to, again, save as a PDF. And on that note, we'll look at going forward. There's a lot I didn't cover here today. I was trying to keep my video to about a half hour. But the, some things you might want to look into are templates, macros, form tools, which there's a whole menu dedicated to, charts, tables, and mail merging. Um, because lynda.com is owned by LinkedIn Learning, which is owned by Microsoft, uh, you're not going to see any LibreOffice tutorials on lynda.com, which is a shame. However, you can go ahead and do searches on YouTube. You'll find a whole bunch of tutorials on YouTube. Uh, just search for the topics that you're looking to learn about and there should be something there. There's also some online documentation, which I have included a link for right here. There is an online forum. If you wanted to ask the community for questions, that link is right here. And if you're looking to get more functionality out of LibreOffice, you can find some templates and extensions here. So that's all I have for today. I appreciate you viewing. Next week we'll be looking at Impress, which is LibreOffice's version of PowerPoint. So we'll be making slideshows. I hope you all tune in and thank you for viewing.